Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another session of EI Live, the K-12 edition. Uh, my name is Cassie and welcome back to those who are joining us again and welcome for our first timers. Uh, we have a great uh, program today. Thank you for joining us for this. Uh, these sessions are brought to you by the Earth Institute at Columbia University. For those of you who, are, who aren't familiar with the Earth Institute, we are a research organization within Columbia, and we blend research in the physical and social sciences, education, and practice to guide the process of sustainable development. Experts that work for the Earth Institute include earth scientists, economists, uh, business and policy experts, specialists in public health and law, researchers, teachers, and students. The Institute is actually made up of more than two dozen or so research centers and several hundred people who collaborate across many disciplines and schools at the, the university. What we're hoping to do with these EI Live K-12 sessions is to introduce you to our interdisciplinary work through our experts. Over the next couple of months, we're going to feature a variety of these sessions for K-12 students and educators, and we're also going to be building on the EI Live series uh, to offer additional content for broader audiences. Today, we're going to hear from Genevieve Coffey from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She's going to be discussing the topic of seismology with us and helping us to understand what seismic sounds mean and how scientists can use sounds and this information from sounds, from seismic sounds, to better understand earthquakes. We'll have Genevieve do her presentation and then open it up for questions towards the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, please use the chat box just to the right of the window, um, or right to the right to this to the right of the video. And we're going to also actually be using the chat box today to get answers from you for a couple of questions that Genevieve is going to have for us throughout the presentation. And once the session is done, we will share a link with everyone who has registered for the event so that you can access the recording later on. If you're having technical difficulties, please email me directly. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to Genevieve. Thank you, Cassie. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Genevieve, um, and I'm going to talk to you for the next half an hour or so about earthquakes, where they're occurring, um, and also how we can use sound to better understand patterns in earthquakes. And so all of this work is um, kind of made by the project called the Seismic Sound Lab, which is um, made by Ben Holtzman and others at Lamont. And this really revolves around using waves and images generated from earthquakes to better understand the nature of these earthquakes, as well as the earth itself. And so just a few things before I get started, um, I'm going to show you lots of videos and give you lots of sounds to look through during this presentation. And I'll also be asking you a few questions like Cassie mentioned towards the end of these videos. And during this time, I'll give you some time to think about it and you can enter those questions into the chat box and we'll discuss your guys' answers. Um, and also each of the videos, um, I'm going to have a little number tag next to it. So if you have any questions about some of the animations that I'm showing, you can ask at the end of the presentation. All right. So first things first, um, what actually is an earthquake? So we know that the earth is laid. It consists of an outer crust in a thick mantle and a core. And so the crust of the earth consists of these things called tectonic plates. They're like jigsaw piece puzzles. They all kind of fit together and they're all moving around. And so mantle convection is a process that actually drives this tectonic plate motion. And so the mantle is the thickest layer of the earth and it's a rock, but it flows on really, really long time scales. So in this animation here, I'm showing you what is 2 billion years of mantle convection compressed down to just over 30 seconds. And so the layer that you can see moving in the video is the mantle and it's colored by temperature. So reds are hotter temperatures and blues are colder. And what you can see here is that as the mantle approaches sort of the base close to the core here, it heats up, it turns that red color. And I'll keep playing this. Um, because it heats up, its density is lower and it's able to rise to the surface where it then cools and then can sink back down. And so we have this sort of mantle convection or circulation of the mantle. 
Um, and it's this process that's actually moving the tectonic plates at the surface. And so if we look at the outer edge of the Earth here, you can see that it's all blue. This is all of our crust, it's really cold, and it slides around with this mantle convection um, over really long time scales. And you can see that in places where there are places where the um, tectonic crust will kind of drop back into the mantle during a process called subduction. And so we see that mantle convection is driving this motion of tectonic plates. So all these plates are moving, um, they're moving at different rates and they're moving in different directions. And because of this, um, every once in a while, these plates will get stuck. And as they get stuck, there's strain that builds up at that stuck patch. And eventually that strain keeps building up and building up until you get an earthquake. And you can kind of visualize this um, yourself at home by just taking your hands and interlocking them together. So you can imagine each plate, each of your hands is a tectonic plate. And if you keep pulling them, just like the, the tectonic plates would be doing in the earth and you pull and you keep pulling, eventually they're gonna slide apart. And it's that kind of release that causes the slip and an earthquake like we see in the world today. And so we're gonna take a quick glance at seismicity around the world. And so now we're looking at 20 years of seismicity from 1993 to 2013. And an interesting thing to note here is just by contrasting it to that video of mantle convection we had before. So we were looking at 2 billion years of mantle convection and now we're jumping to a completely different time scale and we're looking at 20 years of seismicity. And so all of the earthquakes that I'll be showing you in this video here will be magnitude 5.4 and over. And so they're moderate, they're pretty strong earthquakes. Um, and we'll have a look at it and try and when you're thinking, when you're watching it, think about the patterns of earthquakes you see around the world and we'll have a little discussion afterwards. So I'll play the video. So the larger the size of the circle, the larger the earthquake event. And so I'm just going to pause it here and we'll come back to the video. But this is um, one of the points where I wanted to open it up for a question to you guys. And you can just fill out your answer in the chat box next to the video. But um, I just want you guys to write down what you think about where these earthquakes are occurring. Are they occurring all over the screen equally? Or are you seeing particular places where earthquakes are occurring? And just write down kind of any interesting observation you have about where earthquakes are in this map of the world. Genevieve, can I suggest that if you could start the video again, and then um, for our our viewers, um, for as you're rewatching the video, um, to think about where this is happening. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Yeah, if we could just replay it. And um, for those of you who are looking at the chat box, if you could jot down some observations that you have, that would be great. Thanks. Um, would that be an okay point to stop?
Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we have a couple of answers. Mm -hmm. uh, plate boundaries, the ring of fire, coastal areas, and they seem to occur and reoccur in similar places, uh, more northern than southern activity. Yeah, that was awesome. All of those are like very correct observations. And um, I liked that I heard a lot of people talking about plate boundaries and the Pacific Rim of Fire. So um, if you see my cursor here, you can see this large dark patch where nothing much is going on. That's actually the Pacific plate there. And then this area surrounding the Pacific plate, like you mentioned, um, is the Pacific Rim of Fire. And it's one of the most se the seismically active zones in the world. And so it's also associated with a lot of volcanism because we have vol volcanics associated with a lot of the subduction that happens around the Pacific Rim of Fire. Um, so that's great. And we're also seeing other earthquakes. They're also like here in the Himalaya, they're occurring at plate boundaries. Um, yeah, really most of our seismicity is focused along these plate boundaries and they're typically occurring um, they're not just occurring once, they're occurring repeatedly on these plate boundaries. Um, and I wanted to play the video one more time, but we're going to come up to a particularly interesting earthquake now. It happened on Boxing Day of 2004, and it's called the Sumatra Andaman earthquake. It's actually the third largest earthquake that was ever recorded. It's a magnitude 9.2. Um, and just to point out here, when we talk about magnitude, so a single unit in magnitude represents at 10 times greater release of energy. So it's a what we call a logarithmic scale. And so when you're talking about a magnitude six versus a magnitude eight, for instance, the, the difference in the size is, um, is huge. And so this magnitude 9.2 is, um, it's, and yeah, it's a really large event. And so I'll play it here and you'll see kind of how the symbol size here is gonna really um, kind of demonstrate how much larger an event this is than what we typically see. So that earthquake occurred, I think I forgot to mention, in Indonesia, just right here. Um, and it was a particularly devastating, both due to its size and its tsunami um, production after the event. Um, and the one other earthquake that I wanted to point out before we move on is an earthquake that occurred in 2011 in Japan. It was the Tohoku earthquake. It was a magnitude nine. Um, it was also a pretty devastating earthquake that produced tsunamis as well. But just for a reference between that and Indonesia, and the magnitude scale itself, um, we'll have a look at what this event looks like in the context of these earthquakes. <laughs> And so just to kind of follow up on that, um, I showed you two, we're going to come back to both of these earthquakes, but I showed you the Indonesia and the Japan earthquakes. And I mentioned that they both produced large tsunamis and that was part of the reason why they were so destructive. Um, and so just to mention what a tsunami is, a tsunami occurs when you have an earthquake that causes uplift of the seafloor. So there are lots of different earthquakes. Um, so the San Andreas Fault, for instance, is a strike slip earthquake and the displacement occurs horizontally. But in a lot of earthquakes, you get vertical displacement where the seafloor will be pushed upwards. And when you have an earthquake like that occurring in the ocean, um, that seafloor uplifts water. So it's kind of like similar to if you had your hand in a bathtub and you moved your um, hand around, you're going to cause waves. And so because both that Japan and Indonesia earthquake involved uplift of the seafloor, it kind of formed that tsunami wave, which um, caused a lot of damage. And so we have looked at seismology around seismicity around the world. Um, and now we're going to kind of go into a little bit about how we get sounds from those earthquakes. And to do that, we just need to touch quickly on what seismic data is and what is emitted during an earthquake. 
And so during an earthquake, we get the release of seismic waves. Um, these uh, are recorded on an instrument called a seismometer, which is what we have illustrated by this triangle in the picture here. Um, and a seismometer, it measures seismic waves by measuring how the ground moves as these waves pass through it. And so there are two different kinds of seismic waves. There are the faster P waves, which are the, these ones here, and then there are the, the slower, surf, uh, slower S waves shown here. We also have a thing called a surface wave, which moves at that interface between the Earth and the atmosphere, and that is the most destructive of our seismic waves. Um, but so we're going to kind of look at how those seismic waves travel through the Earth in this video here. Our faster moving P waves will be in blue, and our S waves will be in yellow and red. And our earthquake is represented by the star here. So I'll play that and we'll have a look at what they look like. And you'll kind of see as these waves reach the seismometer, the triangle, you'll see um, how that is kind of represented by seismic data and if you follow the trace at the top. And just to rewind a little bit. And so you can see that a seismic trace isn't simple. The waves are diffracted and reflected as they encounter different materials and boundaries in the earth. And so that's what kind of leads to this sort of long, spiky, drawn out seismogram we get here shown above. Um, and so how do we actually hear this seismic data. Um, well, sound is typically measured in, a, in frequency, and so things that normally are higher pitch will have a higher frequency. Um, things that are lower and deeper typically have a lower frequency. And so actually the range of frequencies in seismic data, um, they're too low for us to actually hear. Um, uh, yeah, they're too low to actually be heard by the human ear. And so one way we can get around that is um, you take that seismic data and you just squish it down and you increase its frequency. And so that's why we're showing here. So we've taken a seismic trace, which might be on the order of an hour or so long, and we've um, squished it down to a few seconds so that we can actually hear it. And so I'll move on to the next slide and you'll kind of hear what that actually sounds like. Here we go. So we often, people say that it sounds like thunder to them, kind of this low rumbling noise. And so this is actually an earthquake that occurred in Japan in 2007. And so it occurred where that red circle is here. But so now we're going to look at some of these sounds from these earthquakes in different regions around the world. And just before we launch into the actual videos, let's have a key to the actual symbols and um, the sounds that we'll be hearing in the next slide. So we're going to see different symbols and different colors corresponding to the size of the earthquake and the depth of the earthquakes. So our deeper events are going to be shown in yellow, like you can see there, and the larger symbol size will correspond to larger magnitude events. And the first region we're going to look at is California. And so here I'm going to play the video. It's seven years of earthquakes. The largest earthquake we'll see in the video is in magnitude 6.6. .6. And so I, while I'm playing this earthquake, again, like we saw in the global seismicity video, I want you to kind of think about where these earthquakes are occurring. Um, and put down any observations you have in the chat box next to the video and we'll talk about them after the video. Okay, 
go for it. Okay, I'll give you a couple extra seconds to maybe think about what you saw and then we'll discuss your answers. Oops. Great. So we have uh, two answers. One uh, participant has said um, they've noticed that it's uh, the activities seem to be along fault lines. Uh, someone else has pointed out that there seem to be some safe zones where there are no seismic activities. Uh, and then the other uh, comment has been about the uh, the activity seems to most relatively be near the surface. So those are those are the answers we have for this yeah. video. That's awesome. Those are all exactly right too. Like, um, so to touch on that last one, all of our seismicity is in blue, which indicates that it's all at the surface. And that has something to do with the kind of fault this is. And we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, you also mentioned that earthquakes tended to be concentrated along fault lines and that there are some areas that were relatively void of earthquakes or safer from earthquakes. There's one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the biggest one seemed to also be concentrated in one big one area. Yeah. Great. Um, that kind of ties in with the fault line um, story too. And just for reference before I actually address this is that the biggest one in this um, video is actually magnitude 6.6. .6. But um, to get back to the fact that all these earthquakes are concentrating along these fault lines, that's exactly right. And so we have looking at California, and we have the San Andreas Fault running along the west coast here. Um, and the San Andreas Fault is a strike slip fault. It separates the North American plate from the North American plate. And it's a strike slip fault. And so that is a fault, if you can see my hands here, where all of the motion is going in a horizontal direction. Sorry, I know that's not the easiest to see over video. And so that means that all of your earthquakes are occurring sort of where that slip is. And so that's near the surface. So your earthquakes are occurring near the surface. Um, and that's contributing to just the shallow seismicity we see in this video. Um, you also mentioned that there are bigger earthquakes that tended to occur in um, the similar areas. And that is definitely the case here too. The San Andreas Fault is particularly interesting because it can be separated into different sections um, and those different sections have different sort of seismic characters you might call it and so like the northern and southern sections for example are earthquake producing and they tend to produce pretty large earthquakes like the magnitude um the 1906 san francisco earthquake which was larger than magnitude seven um, there was also another greater than magnitude seven on the southern san andreas fault um, but yeah, so those bigger earthquakes tend to happen on these so-called locked sections and they, yeah. Genevieve, we mm -hmm. just tried to interrupt you, but we've had a request to um, see if we can go back to the slide with the key. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you just want to play that one more time? Yes. Okay. Yeah, this one. Great. Thanks. Okay, it should be going now.
And so um, now we're going to move on to Japan. And um, again, just like before, I'm going to play the video. It's seven years of seismicity. Um, maybe think about where the earthquakes are occurring, what's different from this in California, and maybe write down um, what you're seeing in the chat box next to the video. And I'll play it one more time so you guys can have another look. So we have a couple of answers. Uh, they seem to be mostly along the coast and seem to be deeper. Uh, we have quite a few comments and participants saying that they're deeper. Uh, some see more frequent activity. And one person noted it looks like the plates are diving down at an angle. It's awesome. That's yeah, those are those are really, really great insights. Um, we do Sorry, see, one more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, earthquakes uh, occur at different depths, and there appear to be more earthquakes of medium magnitude compared to California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these events in general are, get much larger than they do in California. The strikingly different um, aspect of this video, like you guys mentioned, is that we're seeing much deeper seismicity. So we're seeing these um, reds and yellows, which are telling us we're getting earthquakes down to um, hundreds of kilometers of depth, um, in depth. Um, we see a lot of earthquakes around here and we see that they're all concentrated again on coastlines or plate boundaries. And this is, um, this is the case here because we're seeing, we have four different tectonic plates here interacting. And so that gives us lots of area for these kind of plates to catch on each other and build up strain and release these earthquakes. Um, you guys mentioned that we have plates sinking down into the mantle, just like we saw in that mantle convection video. Um, and that's the case here too. Um, you guys are totally right. We're seeing, this is a subduction zone. And so at subduction zones, what we see is we have plates converging. And then what happens is that the denser plate gets pushed below the overriding plate. And so when this happens, we get crust sinking down into the mantle um, and when it sinks down into the mantle like this, it also gives us seismicity down to much greater depths because you have that cold crust that's now sinking down to hundreds of kilometers of depth. Um, also, I should have mentioned this at the start of the video, but um, this is where that Tohoku earthquake is. And so I just want to really quickly play this short section of the video again. This is where our magnitude nine earthquake occurred. So you see after that earthquake, you get this huge uptick in the number of earthquakes that happen. And this is called an aftershock sequence. So when you get a large earthquake, you kind of jostle things around in the crust a little more. You load and trigger other faults that might be close by and they release earthquakes. And so you get an uptick in the amount of earthquakes that you get after a large event and this decays over time. I'm gonna zoom into, so the last region that we're gonna look at is Indonesia. Um, 
And this is where we saw that magnitude 9.2 earthquake that completely swamped the screen earlier in that global seismicity video. And this is the last time I'll get you to watch through the video. Um, kind of write down what you see, what you think, how this is different to the last video, or what you think might be similar, and we'll talk about it afterwards. one more time so you guys have another chance to think about it. So, so far we have one answer. Uh, the subduction angle seems deeper. I think that does seem pretty, I'm actually not totally sure what the difference in subduction angle between here and Japan is, but just judging by the, the colors that you see, so you can see again shallow going to yellow, that's occurring over a much shorter distance, which suggests that, yeah, the subduction angle is likely steeper here. It seems like uh, after the 2004 Boxing Day, the number of activity uh, or the amount of activity seems to increase significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of aftershocks yeah. uh, and things sped up a lot after the large quake. And they seem, earthquakes seems to be much more frequent after that. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, that comes down to the, um, the aftershocks that are triggered after that large event too. So similar to the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, we're seeing that large event and then a huge influx of earthquakes following that. And over time, that again, decreases in frequency. Um, and here we're looking at a similar tectonic setting to Japan. We have a subduction zone, like we mentioned before with the slab. Um, here we have the Pacific plate that's being thrust down under the Sunda plate here underneath Indonesia. Um, and that's why you're getting all of this deep seismicity. Um, there are some strikes that folding out towards the left here, which is probably responsible for those shallower blue events. Um, there's also a lot of volcanism, um, which is not obvious in the video, but there's a lot of volcanism that follows um, Indonesia too. And that's actually a consequence of a subduction zone as well. So when you subduct a plate to about 100 kilometers depth, that actually releases a bunch of its water. And when it does that, it lowers the melting point of rock. And that's when you kind of generate volcanoes. So you get melting, you get magma rise, and you get um, volcanoes developing. And one last thing I wanted to point out about this video before I move on to the final section of this is that, so you guys all clearly notice the um, large magnitude 9.2 that happened. And we'll play it one more time. So that earthquake is actually, it's bonkers. It started around here and it moved actually to this kind of region here. And that's about the length of California and the length of time it took for it to kind of move that distance is about 10 minutes. So it kind of just highlights the sort of power and the rate at which earthquakes um, move and slip in. Okay, and so we've talked a lot about um, these tectonic earthquakes, so earthquakes occurring due to movement of the plates and between and at plate boundaries. 
but we as humans can actually induce earthquakes too. Um, and we can do this in a number of different ways. But one of the ways I wanted to talk about today is um, something called wastewater injection. And so this is a process that's associated with the oil and gas industry um, and a couple of different processes. Um, wastewater is involved in fracking, which is when you um, create small cracks underneath the ground to provide pathways for hydrocarbons to reach the surface. You use wastewater to make those cracks and that wastewater has to go somewhere else. It's also used in um, just general oil extraction just to help move oil um, closer to the surface. And so when you do this, you're contaminating that water, you're also adding chemicals to that water. And so you need to store it and you can't really store it just at the surface. So people tend to inject it into the ground. Um, and that's this process called wastewater injection. And so you can see an example of that here um, where we have a wastewater injection well shown here. So you inject all that um, water after it's been used and it's um, no longer useful. You inject it into a porous medium like a limestone or a sandstone. So that just means a rock with lots of space for that water to, to kind of um, be stored. And when you do that, there's a couple of different concerns. The first is that you can't really control where that water is going. So it might actually kind of travel into something called an aquifer, which contains drinking water. So that's again a porous rock that contains water that we often pump up to the ground to, to drink. The other possibility is that it kind of flows to a fault. And so when that happens, which is what we're showing right here, um, that water might flow into a fault. You actually push that fault apart when you add that water to it, and that can actually trigger it to slip. And so in doing that, you can actually trigger earthquakes. We see really small earthquakes up to a magnitude fives. And this was um, particularly notable in Oklahoma, um, where there's a lot of wastewater injection that happens in the state. And they actually increased injection rates between the years of around 2008 to 2015. And you can really see that in the seismicity. So I'm gonna play this video and you can kind of see how that evolves through time. And this is a little different to the videos we saw before. The color no longer means depth. All of our earthquakes are really shallow, like around five kilometers deep. Um, and, but the size again corresponds to the, the size of the symbol, sorry, corresponds to the earthquake size. Um, And you can see in this video that it really starts off slow, but it, the seismicity rate really picks up um, around the 2012 time. And there are also these earthquakes are mostly focused around um, injection well sites. But um, since then, I think regulations have gone stricter and the, the amount of seismicity <laughs> has dropped significantly. It's still occurring, but nowhere near the extent that it did in 2016, 2015. Um, and just for reference, the largest earthquake that occurred in Oklahoma was a magnitude 5.8 and that occurred in September of 2016. And while most of these earthquakes are pretty small, twos and threes, if you have a magnitude 5.8 happen underneath your house, it's gonna be a significant hazard. Um, yeah. And so that was the last slide I had to show to you. And just, I wanted to also just acknowledge Ben Holtzman, Jason Candler and Douglas Rapetto, who are the creators of this content and the Sound Lab. And you can find all of these videos on the Sound Lab website as um, if you're interested in looking at more videos, more regions, and other earthquake sounds. Cool. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Great. Thank you, Genevieve. So the first question that we had uh, a while back was um, whether or not the group has tried to uh, capture the sounds of the largest earthquake ever recorded, and what is the largest earthquake yeah. ever recorded? So it's a great question. Um, they have not, and that is 
primarily because it occurred in like the 1960s. And so it was a little bit before we had the instrumentation. We had seismometers, but we didn't have nearly the coverage that we have today. Um, and the largest earthquake ever recorded, that was a magnitude 9.5 and it occurred in Chile. So Chile is another place that gets, it's a subduction zone, it gets these really large earthquakes. It's not uncommon for them to experience magnitude sevens and eights. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, what's the process like for you to videos, the wonderful videos that you showed us? I still love watching these. I've seen these a lot, but I enjoy watching them every time. What's the process like to go from uh, taking an act one sound recording to creating, for example, that world, uh, that big world map, uh, yeah. with all of the, the recordings? Yeah, I don't. So I personally, myself, have never actually made these videos. Um, but they're all made by Ben Holtzman and others, but so I can't speak to the process itself. I can tell you that um, the coding and all of this, um, the, yeah, all of the coding behind this um, is part of a sonification script through Python that I think Josh Russell is going to be going through in May and he'll be able to talk through the process a lot more. Um, but in terms of a timeline, um, these videos are typically kind of made sort of over a, over two or three months, I think. Sorry, I can't answer that one too much better than no, that. No, not a problem. <laughs> we, I can definitely follow up about that uh, with Ben. Um, we have a couple questions here. Are there any natural faults in Oklahoma or was that just purely from the injections? Yeah, so that's a very good question and something I actually really glossed over. Um, so there are, so while Oklahoma is not on a tectonic boundary now, um, there are, and while it doesn't really have any naturally active faults, so they, I mean, I mean that, um, there are faults all throughout Oklahoma, but a lot of these faults were created over Earth's history. So throughout Earth's history, there's been continental formation and breakup events, so you have fracturing and fault formation, and then, um, these faults become inactive over time as the earth kind of reorganizes itself. So a lot of these faults that um, are active now in Oklahoma due to this injection, they're, um, they likely formed a long time ago when the earth was doing something a little different, stress orientations around the world were slightly different um, and it was more sort of conducive to tectonic earthquakes. So these are older earthquakes that weren't produced by injection, but they're getting reactivated by injection. Great. And another question related to Oklahoma is, mm -hmm. was there, do you, do you know if there was evidence uh, whether or not there were contaminants from the injections uh, that entered aquifers? I, I don't believe so. I don't. I don't think I know completely, but mm -hmm. at least nothing on a larger scale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's a question about whether or not these videos are available to show students uh, during the next school year. I'm not sure which videos you're referring to, but the for the Seismic Sound Lab videos, uh, I believe you can find most of them online at that website that right mm -hmm. there. So www.seismicsoundlab.org. As for the EI Live K-12 videos, they will be available. So uh, we will put them up on an EI Live site. Uh, we're still building that site out. So when that becomes available, we'll definitely share that. Um, we're gonna, so if anybody else has questions, please enter it into the chat box. And while we, we do have, while we wait for a couple more questions, I wanted to see if you could speak to uh, sort of earthquake preparedness in the locations that you've, uh, you've shared with us. So we have, you know, Oklahoma is one example, uh, but Japan versus California and Indonesia, um, and sort of how prepared those places are for earthquakes, what kind of detection systems are in place, what happened to the, um, the places that were most affected after the earthquakes. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess I can start with California. And so as a whole, um, Japan and California have a relatively high level of earthquake preparedness. Um, because they're such tectonically active areas, there's been a lot of time and research invested in monitoring and um, the technologies that might provide earthquake early warning, for instance. So both in California and Japan, um, 
they've been rolling out for the last few years, um, something called earthquake early warning on cell phones. And so the way this works is that, so there are seismometers, really dense seismometers across California and Japan due to their high seismic hazard. And the way earthquake early warning works is that if there is an earthquake um, that occurs, um, if it's detected on some seismometers, they might be able to issue a, um, a warning to elsewhere in the state um, or a country or region um, so that people might have enough time to, this is only, we're talking about time in the order of like seconds, but it might be enough time for people to get in a sheltered location. So under a table, for instance, and something that's really cool that's been developed both in Japan and California related to this is um, earthquake early warning through um, cell phones. And so the way this actually works, it's really, it's, it's really awesome is that if you have a certain app, I think it's called Shake Alert in California, for instance, um, and enough people with this app, um, if it's on a surface, if it's like the ground moves enough to, to kind of trigger an alert and enough phones, an earthquake early warning could go out to um, a large number of people. And so that's like using stationary phones to act as like little seismometers that can provide warning. Um, and so that's, it's a, it's a really, it's a really cool kind of citizen science, citizen alert sort of system. Um, yeah, and buildings in both California and Japan, uh, I know in California there's been extensive retrofitting of a lot of buildings and they're kind of built with um, the idea of withstanding earthquakes in mind. So this is, tends to be involving things that will flex in earthquakes as opposed to really rigid buildings that might break. So you've um, one really form a common um, earthquake damage and sort of sort of less well-off areas is something called pancaking where you have rigid surfaces and the actual story between floors can collapse. And so if you have a flexible building or something built with um, that can actually take up that motion, you can you have a, essentially a safer, more earthquake resistant building. And that's, a, I think that's the case in a lot of, um, buildings and infrastructure in California and Japan. It's not the case in Indonesia, unfortunately. Um, and that's why they, they get so much damage and loss of life during earthquakes. Um, the Tohoku earthquake in Japan um, and Indonesia with the tsunami, that's another aspect that, that caused a lot of damage and there are actually tsunami warning systems in place now. So typically, you have these things called tide gauges, which can, they kind of measure how the water moves. So after an earthquake, there's usually, you have an idea if that earthquake is going to cause a tsunami in the first place. So that might issue an alert for people to move away from coastlines. But then you also have the added tide gauges. So if, if there are, if there's like any significant change in tide or change in the water level, sorry, um, that might also contribute to a tsunami warning system. Um, is there anything else you'd like me to talk about? That's, I'm trying to yes. just kind of win all so, over the place no, there. There's, yeah. uh, there's one more question mm -hmm. about uh, how densely are seismographs and instruments distributed around the world? Um, yeah, it's a good question. And it's, it would be cool if I had a slide to show that. Um, they're not very densely distributed. So um, I don't know about numbers, but you're going to see probably and it varies based upon the place, based upon how active an area is. Um, I don't have a good estimate, but you're typically probably going to see um, hundreds of kilometers or miles between seismographs or seismic stations. Um, this was a little different in the US recently. I think over the last um, few years, they did something called the Transportable Array, which was a sort of a big science initiative which involved, and actually it's in Alaska right now, but it involved um, kind of stepping seismic stations across the US itself. And so these were really densely um, spaced seismic stations, much denser than we normally have, because it involves a lot of um, kind of money into maintenance and things to kind of maintain a really dense system for a long period of time. Um, but they stepped it, so they would have a bunch of seismic stations in one part of the US for a period of time and then move it across and across, and now it's currently in Alaska. But So that's the, the densest example of um, seismographs I can think of, and that was done to try and, um, so when you have an earthquake, um, 
scientists and geophysicists can learn about the structure of the Earth using those seismic waves. And so if you have a really dense station, that can help you really learn about that structure more. D dense seismic station network, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question is uh, whether or not seismologists are against fracking in general. Yeah. You might be able to speak from your perspective. And uh, the follow-up to that was, uh, do you think the oil industry is taking sort of natural fault uh, fault lines and faults into consideration with oil deposits? It's a tricky question. Um, and it would be t entirely speaking from my perspective. Um, I think it's a balance. I think that we obviously need fossil fuels and we're not at a stage where we can exist purely on renewables right now. I think the more time and focus needs to be put into renewable energies. Um, and that fracking is, I think any process that involves the production of a material that you can't safely dispose of is a little tricky and should be minimized in that respect, unless you can come up with a more, um, come up with a system that is more controllable. So I think the problem with wastewater injection um, and the way we do it now is that we don't know where all the faults are. So as I mentioned before, we have these remnant faults from the past reorganization of the earth and past um, that might no longer be active. So we don't, and we might not have invested time and in research into kind of imaging the crust there to see where these faults are. So when you inject water into kind of a relatively unknown kind of um, unknown area, then you're really opening up yourself the chance to like to cause these events. And so maybe there would be a good compromise where if you were able to invest enough money into kind of really fully understanding an area and understanding like the tectonic hazard associated with an area to um, and water injection, then maybe that would be um, a better um, a, a way to do it. But I think because there are so many uncertainties, both with the faults and how the fluid moves, you don't really know what's gonna be um, affected by that. Um, I can't remember the last part of the question, sorry. Um, no problem. It's whether or not, oh, well, I think you actually answered it, um, is okay. that we should be more aware of where the fault lines are before sort of uh, oh, yeah. digging into yeah. research. Yeah. So we did have a follow-up question about the number of instruments and uh, where they're available. Um, the participant is curious uh, about whether or not the numbers have changed over time. So have we gotten to have more instruments over time, better technology? Um, and of course, if there are more in other in some places versus others. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a great question. And yeah, over time, we have definitely seen more instruments and more and the technology is improving as well. So instruments are becoming more sensitive. And the methods actually involved in deploying instruments are becoming better as well. So um, seismometers are only really were deployed starting from the 50s and 60s. So it's a really recent technology in some ways. Um, and they're continually being deployed and new seismometers are being put in all kinds of different areas. Like, for example, Antarctica has been a place of a lot of seismometers are being um, put in order to understand not only earthquakes but also understand the way the glaciers move because they um, cause earthquake-like events in a seismometer that you can see. Um, there's yeah and as we try and understand different aspects of the way the world works like um, what happens to some of these subducted slabs when they um, are kind of thrust into the mantle we have been deploying more of these seismic stations. Um, in terms of where, there's definitely, like I mentioned before, there's a lot that go around seismically active areas. Um, yeah, um, and just also regions where, regions of interest. So that might be the Himalayas, for instance, or regions that might have interesting earthquakes or might provide interesting information about earth structure based upon it gets kind of complicated, but based upon where these waves travel, the path that wave would travel through the earth to the seismic station can tell you a lot about the way that earth looks. Um, yeah, and so the kind of station design and the areas of focus kind of depends on, depends on that. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. Uh, so we have oh, we have one more just under the wire. Uh, how long does it take for strong seismic waves to propagate around the world? That's a really good question. Um, I wish I could provide a better answer for that. Um, so if, for strong seismic waves to propagate around the world, so if you're going to have it from a source to come back. Uh, no. Oh, I could. That would require a little bit of maths, but I think it would be on the order of like three hours around that, give or take. Um, but then these seismic waves are continually propagating as well. So um, once they've gone around the world once, they'll go around again and again. So you can actually get the earth kind of ringing for days after an earthquake again. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I think we'll end there with questions unless I get some in the next uh, minute or so. Um, so anything else, Genevieve, you wanna mention to our participants before we wrap up? Um, I think that, that was it. This was really fun though, and I'm really happy to be involved. Perfect, thank you. Um, so as the, our viewers can see, uh, all of the videos that Genevieve did uh, include in her presentation today are available at the seismicsoundlab.org uh, address. If you have any questions uh, about her slides or about anything else, feel free to email me. Again, we'll send out a recording of this video to all of the participants who registered uh, and sent in their RSVPs on Eventbrite. Uh, probably later this week by Wednesday or Thursday. And as Genevieve mentioned, her colleague Josh Russell is going to be doing some sessions later in May. We haven't announced those yet publicly. We will put up a new schedule at the end of this week, hopefully, uh, with the rest of the sessions that we have until the end of June. So Josh will go into much more detail over two sessions about how those uh, these sound videos that uh, Genevieve showed, um, the process of actually creating them. If you're interested in Python or learning a little bit more about Python, these would be great great sessions to attend. Um, a little bit of background in Python helps, but it's not required. Um, but if you're really interested in getting into the nitty gritty of those videos, that would be a fantastic session. So thank you very much, Genevieve. It was great. Like I said, I always love seeing these videos. I've seen them a lot, but they're, I think we learn something new each time that we see them. And thank you again to our very active participants um, and for your great questions. And we'll see you on Wednesday for the next uh, EI live session. Very great. Thank you, Genevieve. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody.